If all is well with the world, Noah Rubin should be on the line. Hey, no one. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, and you have a room full of maybe 150 people that are also hearing you. <laughs> cool. Uh, I think uh, we're, we're close enough to the start time, and now we've annoyed everybody and stopped your conversation. So I think we can get started. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we, uh, so I can get a gauge of the room. How many lawyers do we have in the audience? Almost none, I assume so. Uh, how many musicians in the audience? Pretty good. Uh, how many coders in the audience? Awesome. Uh, how many that have not uh, identified with any of those so far? Good. All right. So th th we get a sense of what we're doing. Um, so thanks so much for coming. Uh, we're talking about uh, right now uh, a project that Noah, who is on the line right now, and I have been working on for the last couple of years, uh, and that's the All the Music Project. And if all's well with the world, oh, come on, computer. There we go. All right. So uh, who's heard of Dua Lipa? I assume everybody has, right? Um, everybody's heard about her lawsuit, right? Uh, the the uh, Live Your Life by Af Article Sound System sounds like all day, all night. Party to the sunrise now. And then Dua Lipa is, you, moonlight, you're my starlight I need. Right? Uh, who thinks that's substantially similar? Raise your hand. Uh, sadly, um, th that was a trap. Uh, that, that was a wrong question to be ask uh, asking. So that's, that's my fault. Uh, but really, the question that we're asking, why is that shutting off? Did somebody shut those off? Yeah. All right, all right, cool. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, we, we almost got really moody right there. Uh, so the, the, the question I asked was about substantial similarity, which is what everybody goes to when they go to these questions. But really the question is, uh, should the question be, is it copyrightable in the first place? Is the thing that you're trying to connect, uh, that's, that's the legal question. Step one is, is it copyrightable? Step two is, did the second person have access to the first person's thing? And then only after you answer those two yes, do you get to the question of substantial similarity. So that I, I trapped you, sorry about that, but that, that's really the trap that everybody gets into. And that's the trap that actually befell uh, George Harrison. So if you think about George Harrison and the chiffons, the chiffons in 1963 said, he's so fine, right? And then George Harrison said, my sweet lord, he had a bit later. Um, so what he didn't think about and what nobody really thought about is maybe the chiffons grabbed this existing melody from this uh, finite melodic data set that existed in the world. And maybe George Harrison grabbed that same melody from that same finite uh, melodic data set. Maybe they independently created this same melody. Um, but sadly, uh, the judge didn't think so. Uh, the judge uh, instead dinged uh, George Harrison with 200, uh, I think $500,000 or almost a million dollars, which in today's dollars is like $3 million in today's dollars. So when you think about the way that music exists, uh, a lot of non-musicians think, well, every musician has a blank slate that they could be able to then put their creativity into. But sadly, that's not true uh, because they don't have a blank slate. Instead, you have to avoid every song that's been created. That is every copyrighted song. Because if you don't avoid that, um, say you pick a song, uh, great, I picked one that hasn't been created yet. Um, but what if I pick one that's been created? If you're lucky then, if you have somebody that says, hey, that song sounds like this other song, maybe you shouldn't release this, otherwise you get sued. And uh, so if you're lucky, that happens. Sadly, if you're unlucky, you don't have that person uh, telling you that and then you get sued. You just stepped on a melodic landmine uh, that you may not have known existed because you may not have heard that earlier song before, right? But you can still get sued. And under this George Harrison case, even if you subconsciously infringed it, you're on the hook for $2.5 million or so. So this was the world before Noah and I started our project. Um, and this is the world after Noah and I <laughs> started our project. Uh, We've mathematically exhausted every melody that's been, arguably, and every melody that ever can be by brute forcing music. And so the, the idea is we're trying to uh, remedy something that's not fair. Uh, right? What we're trying to do is saying, if you independently create something that somebody else independently created, you shouldn't be sued for that. Because under the law, you should be permitted to independently create. That's actually supposed to be the law. It's been the law for 100 years. But sadly, this George Harrison case actually changed this. Um, so I, I'm a lawyer. I started, uh, be, became a lawyer in 2002. I litigated for about 15 years for, with a big law, law firm called Robbins Kaplan. I actually represented Best Buy uh, for about a decade. Uh, so I, I'm a lawyer. I'm also a musician. I have a bachelor's degree in music uh, before I went to law school. Um, I'm also a coder. I've been coding since 1985, uh, not very well. And Noah on the line right now is a much better coder than I am. Uh, so really, I'm in the Venn diagram of all, the, all three of those things. And Noah is both a musician and a coder as well. And so we were looking at this injustice. And the injustice that we we're looking at is that this song sounds a lot like that song. You guys probably thought about that, like Dua Lipa and, and the others. Um, and there's a reason for that, because there are only so many notes. There are only so many melodies going around. And it's almost impossible to not overlap 
even if you haven't heard this thing. And so if music, for the musicians in the audience, you know that's a lot different than visual art, right? If you were an abstract painting, the odds of being able to overlap this abstract painting with something else is next to zero, right? It's almost infinitely different. Um, and then the math on the being able to take a, uh, take a literary work that is words, um, the math on that is all next to impossible. And because we have a technical audience, um, the math on being able to say, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, that's eight. And if you have 10 repeated notes, the math on that is 8 to the 10th power. Okay? Um, if you take the English language, there are not 8 notes. There are 147,000 words uh, in the English language. So the math on that 10 words repeating is 147,000 to the 10th power. Um, there are more atoms in the world uh, than, I, I'm sorry, there are fewer atoms in the world than that combination. So the odds of being able to overlap accidentally uh, that uh, 10 word sentence is uh, fewer, uh, more atoms than there are, more than there are atoms in the universe. Anyway, it's really hard. Uh, but we're not talking about 147,000 words. We're talking about eight notes, right? So eight to the 10th power is about 64 billion. Uh, so that was our first data set, is we created 64 billion. And the way we did that, uh, and I should say the way Noah did that, is you know uh, we worked in cybersecurity. Noah and I uh, worked together on a, on a, a, a thing um, I can say publicly because Facebook said publicly that Facebook hired our company to investigate Cambridge Analytica. So we were spending um, our time on Facebook's campus, uh, and uh, at the end of a long day, I said, Noah, you know how we can brute force a password? Uh, and the way you do that, of course, is say A, 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 B, A, C. Um, maybe we could do that with music. Maybe we could go, do 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 re do 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 mi do do fa until we mathematically exhaust every melody that's been and ever can be. Uh, and the way that looks in MIDI is like this. Anybody who's worked in MIDI is it looks like this: do 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 re do do mi do do fa, and you just march through until you finish it off. And so uh, I proposed this over a beer uh, at the lounge in the hotel that we were staying at, and Noah said, "F yeah, let's do that." Um, so we did that. Uh, that is Noah did that, and within a few hours he had a prototype where we just marched through um, all the possible variants of every melody, and that is every popular melody that's ever been, and every popular melody that ever can be. And once you do that, you have a very interesting question. You have, you know, there are melodies that happened before, um, and then you have our data set that we filled up. Um, and if you overlap those things, there's a really interesting question, uh, because have we infringed every melody that's ever been? <laughs> and since 2019, all the green spots has everybody infringed us in the three years. And at this point, you might think, you know, are these guys trolls? Uh, and the answer is no, we are not trolls. We are not copyright trolls. Because as soon as we did all these things, we put everything in the public domain. We put them under Creative Commons Zero. And the reason that we did that is we want to keep these green spaces open for other songwriters to be able to do. We want to be able to keep, uh, you know, everybody, now it's been three years since 2019. So if somebody in 2020 made a song and then sued somebody in 2022, that was in the green spot, we wanted to be able to say, hey man, uh, you actually built yours after us. Uh, therefore, we have first rights, right? And so you should, uh, and maybe you've heard our talk. Therefore, you have access to our thing. So that's, that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to make this uh, world better for songwriters. Um, and so you take law plus music plus technology, and from a legal sense, um, it maybe works out like this, that melodies maybe are just finite math. Right? Maybe it is not really creative. You're just marching through these things. And, and I guess selection of the melody is kind of creative. But melodies are math. But if you look at uh, melody to a computer, uh, and the coders in this world, uh, in this room, can say that do, re, mi, re, do is literally one, two, three, two, one. So one, two, three, two, one is the mathematical representation of that melody. So if you were to say, hey, I'm going to copyright one, two, three, two, one, any mathematician is going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? Right? You can't copyright one, two, three, two, one. But you can copyright a melody, which that's, has that same representation. So maybe melodies are math. And under the law, math is facts. You can't copyright math because they're just factual. Uh, you can't copyright it. They're not creative. So facts either have thin copyright or no copyright at all. So really, through transitive the uh, theory, right? maybe melodies are math, which are facts, which maybe are not copyrightable, or they shouldn't be copyrightable. Maybe there should these you stole my melody lawsuits that, that we're trying to remedy. Maybe they'll go away. Maybe they get dismissed. 
So when we were sitting at the hotel uh, at the end of a long day, um, I, th we, we, I initially said, hey, Noah, let's, let's brute force the entire keyboard uh, so that we you know, do everything. Uh, but then he said, yeah, that's, that's going to take like 20 years of compute. And we thought, maybe we don't want to do 20 years of compute. <laughs> uh, so then we thought, OK, what's the human vocal range? And that's two, two octaves or so. I said, OK, maybe we limit it to two octaves. And we said, that's probably going to take nine months or so to do. Uh, and then I thought, really, the problem we're trying to solve is nobody sues over classical music. Uh, everybody sues over pop music. Pop music has like one octave if best. Uh, so we, we said, okay, one octave, that's our MVP, right? We're going to shoot with, for one octave. So we went with one octave. So uh, the initial data set, data set number one was do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. That is eight. So we did eight. Uh, and then we also did the minor, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. So we did those two data sets. Uh, written in MIDI, it looks like this. Uh, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Or do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Um, and then we tried to map that against other you stole my melody lawsuits that have happened. So if you think about George Harrison and the chiffons, it's he's so fine, oh, so fine, versus George Harrison's my sweet lord, oh, sweet lord. And that fits our data set, eight up, 10 across. And then we also had do, 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 right? Pretty close. Not, not, not quite exact, but pretty close. It's substantially similar, as they say in the law. And then you have Tom Petty's, oh, I won't back down, no, I won't back down, versus uh, Sam Smith's, won't you stay with me, because you're all I need. So pretty close, right? And it also fits within our uh, parameters. You have Katy Perry, do, 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 do. Actually, that's flame. And Katy Perry's is, do, 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 do. Last two are different. Jury didn't care. $2.8 million. <laughs> $2.8 million for that ridiculously simple thing that actually shows up in our data set number one, Noah's in my data set number one, 8,196 times that thing shows up. We cranked that out at 300,000 melodies per second, the thing that she got dinged $2.8 million for. Right? Is that just? Is that right? It doesn't make sense to us. Right? So data set number one was eight pitches up, uh, both in the major and the minor, and then 12 across. Data set number two was chromatic. So a lot of people were saying, oh, you don't do classical music. You don't do jazz. So cool. Uh, data set, we just did the MVP with the major minor. Now we do chromatic, the black, black notes and the white notes. Uh, data set number three is a lot of people said, hey, you don't have rhythm. Why don't you have rhythm? You're not doing it right. So we added rhythm. And the way we added rhythm is adding one of the pitches is silence. Uh, so that covers whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, et cetera. So then we have, and we have an octave and a half. So for those say, oh, some melodies are more than an octave. Cool. So we went that octave, we went down a fifth, and we went up a third. Uh, so then we've got more than, and uh, tell me a pop song that has more, uh, more range than that. Uh, good luck with that. So the, really, if you want to expand those parameters, it's just a matter of adding compute and adding parameters. Cool. If you want to do 50 up and 20 across, uh, just give me enough hard drive space and whatever, and we're able to do that. Um, so really, uh, at this point, we have, we've made 400 billion melodies or so, but Noah and I go back and forth as to whether it's 200 billion or 400 billion, because there are a lot of overlap between uh, the chromatic data set and our data set. So um, the number of MIDI files, arguably 400 billion, but there are a lot of dupes uh, between those 400 billion. Um, at this point, uh, Noah's been very kindly stand, uh, waiting on signal uh, audio, but uh, this is, at this point, I'm going to introduce him. Noah is probably one of the smartest pre people I know and definitely the smartest coder I know. Uh, he's a cybersecurity incident response guy who works for, uh, he's a Cornell grad. Uh, we work together at Strauss Freeberg doing incident response with some of the biggest incidents that have ever happened. I'm currently working in security for AWS, so if you have any hosting on AWS, you're in good hands with cybersecurity because Noah is uh, working with you. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Noah, assuming he's still on signal, uh, and talking about maybe Python and, uh, and Rust and the kind of ways that he approached this problem. Yeah, can you hear me okay still? Yep, we can hear you great. Parallel processing in Python. 
natively, it's a bit difficult. And so we ran into some bottlenecks and, and memory leak issues, but Python was really great for just trying to get something working. And then uh, for those of you that don't know what Rust is, Rust is a relatively new systems programming language that I am a huge fanboy of, <laughs> big fan. And it's, it's generally useful for a lot of things, uh, even though it's technically designed as a systems programming language. So we needed better um, IO speeds and better ability to parallel process in the beginning. So I switched to Rust. And we did some benchmarking. I was getting at, at uh, like the maximum throughput for the Python concept I wrote was around 170,000 melodies per second. And that was parallel, in parallel. Um, with the Rust version, we were getting 330,000 melodies per second, single thread. Um, so we were very happy with that performance and, and decided and also it's, had a job. Uh, and sorry, I, I, just one interruption. So 300,000 melodies per second, right? Um, the length of copyright is life of the author plus 100 years. So think about that. He was pushing through 300,000 melodies per second for something that we give somebody mon a monopoly. Nobody else can use that thing for life of the author plus 100 years. Just wanted to do that point. Noah's awesome, and he pushed things through very quickly. Uh, go ahead, Noah. Yeah, and I think you know the main bottleneck we had was IO. Anyway, uh, Damien and I are somewhat of a bootstrap organization. We don't have a ton of money. <laughs> and I wasn't working at AWS at the time, so I could just buy a bunch of uh, or pay for a bunch of EC2 instances. So we bought a server and some uh, Samsung Evo SSDs, which are great, and we put them in a RAID configuration, but uh, our bottleneck was primarily IO based. And so I'm not sure we could have, it, it, it's something that I've experiment, experimented with now, but um, not totally sure if we could increase the throughput even if we did the uh, melody generation in parallel. So anyway, that was the that was the process. It's prototype in Python, and then write a more performant version in Rust. Um, there, the, all of the code is open source and on GitHub. And I'm actually working through um, prototyping the parallel processing now. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the gist of it. Cool. And and no, I'm showing on all the music info is our website. Uh, from there, you can get links to the GitHub repo. You can also get links to the Internet Archive where we posted all of these things. Uh, the idea is that we have friends at the Internet Archive, and uh, the idea is that ev because everyone has access to the Internet Archive, uh, if you go to the copyrightability, access, and substantial similarity, now everybody has access to our 400 billion melodies. Uh, is the idea. Um, so to the extent you want to be able to help with the project, uh, that we do have the GitHub repo. Go ahead and uh, you know clone it and be able to build things out. Um, the idea is that uh, you know we have lots of ideas on the, what we're able, uh, able to do. Uh, one of them is maybe expanding out beyond uh, beyond what we've already done. Maybe you want to do the entire keyboard. All uh, right, we'd love for you to be able to do that. Maybe do all the subdivisions and sub subdivisions, etc. Uh, maybe do all the chords on top of the melodies. Uh, there's lots of cool things if you're inclined uh, to be able to further blow up uh, music. At least they blow up the idea of being able to monopolize a melody um, and just start filling up all the things. Um, so anyway, so want to help? Uh, please feel free to join us. Uh, we're currently working with. Uh, so we have um, the beauty of this talk is that my talk, I, I give a TED talk on this. Uh, it's been seen 1.5 million times or so. Um, because of that, a lot of folks have reached out to me, including including the former economist of Spotify. This is the guy who decides whether uh, figures out how you're going to make money in music. Um, Spotify has a uh, has a, a patent application uh, where uh, they've said if you input a melody we will output all the songs that include that melody. Uh, so we're currently working with them to say, hey, can we input all 400 billion of our melodies uh, to, with all the songs that are there to maybe fill in that graph, right? That'll maybe see which are the red spots that have been copyrighted. Um, that's thing number one. Maybe thing number two is then push in all the Mozart and the Brahms and the Be Beethoven and Bach and see what's public domain, right? And if somebody sues over, you stole my melody, we can say, no, 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 Bach used that 200 years ago or 300 years ago, right? Uh, so that's, uh, if you think about the red notes are copyrighted, maybe there's a bunch of gray notes that we could input and be able to figure out there. Anyway, so there's lots of ways you can help uh, be able to figure out what are the red spots, what are the green spots, what are the gray spots uh, that are copyrighted public domain, in other words. Uh, so. And any questions? So while, while Noah's on the phone, uh, any questions for Noah so far on the technical aspect before I go into the legal aspect of what's happened since? I'm sure there will be others. Uh, so uh, does, I'll move on to the legal aspect. So after the talk, it turns out that there was, uh, there was lots of uh, 
well, I guess let's talk about the problem we're solving. Uh, so th there is not just one melody in a song, but there's many melody melodies, many melodies, because you have the intro, the verse, pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, solo, right? There's lots of up to 10 or more melodies in any given song. And SoundCloud has 200 million songs in it, right? That SoundCloud is, is and YouTube has even more than that. Um, so by 2024, they keep adding uh, more the songs to SoundCloud. So uh, 3 billion melodies or so uh, we have. So that's, uh, that's a lot, uh, right? Uh, so we're running out of melodies is the idea. Um, and we want to keep that space open for songwriters. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's the idea of independent creation. Uh, the, what you see on the screen is a judge named Learned Hand. In 1924, he said that if somebody happens to actually write the same words as Keats's Ode to a Grecian Urn, but the new poet hasn't heard Ode to a Grecian Urn, um, you could be able to independently have copyright in that poem because they independently created. Uh, that's Learned Hand. Uh, but the problem is uh, the whole idea with, uh, with uh, uh, George Harrison case is that did away with this idea of independent creation because the judge said, you know, I believe you that George Harrison that you didn't consciously infringe, but what I think you happened was you subconsciously infringed. Um, but there's a problem with that uh, because they've taken away the copyrightable question in the first place. They jumped straight to access. Um, so to be able to say you subconsciously infringed, well, what if he independently created the thing, right? And under Learned Hand, you said you could independently create it, but through the subconscious, they say, okay, they focused on the access, uh, not on the copyrightability of the thing. Um, so subconscious infringement essentially killed uh, this idea of independent creation, uh, because how do you prove a negative? How do you prove you've never heard a song on Spotify? Um, any philosophy major will say that proving a negative is impossible. You cannot do it. Uh, you cannot prove you've never heard it on a, a grocery store uh, loudspeaker. You've never heard it in the car with a friend. You've never heard it someone holding their phone up to you saying, hey, hear this song. Proving a negative of subconscious infringement is impossible. Um, so this idea of independent creation is dead, uh, effectively. It's been around for 100 years, but really every person that has been sued for this idea of uh, you stole my melody has lost because if the original song is famous enough, uh, of course you subconsciously infringed it, even if you don't remember. So it's frankly bullshit, right? It's, it's a ridiculous out outcome. Uh, we said, you know, this idea of access, did you have access to the thing? Everybody has access to everything with Spotify or YouTube or anything like that. Um, because it really there's uh, the idea of uh, there's full access where you prove access where um, George Harris, or not uh, John Fogarty, um, had access to John Fogarty, uh, where this is, he had a case with Credence, uh, where he was sued by himself, by Credence, over a song. He definitely had access to that. Um, uh, let's do another song where uh, a baby goes, um, uh, uh, da 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 records it to a, uh, records it to a toy. Uh, it's a fixed, tangible medium, therefore copyrighted. Um, if then Taylor Swift says, I stay up too late, uh, nothing in my brain, right? Um, <laughs> did, that did Taylor Swift copy the baby? Clearly not, right? Because Taylor Swift did not ac have access to the babies, right? So that's clearly no access. But almost every single song is not access or no access. It's maybe access, maybe not. Uh, maybe they, the person heard it, maybe they didn't hear it, maybe they subconsciously infringed. So what the law calls that is a fact question. Uh, and the problem about facts questions is that's almost every case is a fact question. Did they hear it or did they not hear it? And the problem with fact questions is those don't get resolved right away in a case. As a litigator, I know that first you have a cease and desist letter saying, hey, uh, you need to pay me money, otherwise I'll sue you. Uh, if that doesn't happen, I sue you. Uh, and then it goes through a complaint and after years, only at trial or at summary judgment is that fact question resolved. So how much does it cost to be able to get to that question? Uh, between you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to be able to pay lawyers just to roll the dice and then maybe get damages out of the deal. So if you're faced with maybe $2 million in legal fees and then maybe a few million dollars in damages on top of that, and you're faced with, you know, like, like Sam Smith was, uh, what are you gonna do? You settle. You say, well, I can spend $2 million and roll the dice or I can make Tom Petty a co-songwriter of my song. This is a shakedown, right? It's essentially what it is. Um, the Hollies had something that, uh, I'm a creep, I'm a weirdo, sound a lot alike. They said, hey, Radiohead, pay us money. They made them co-songwriters, gave them a lot of their royalties. Um, Lana Del Rey had a song that sounded a lot like Creep. And they reportedly made, uh, say, offered to say, hey, why don't you make you co-songwriters? -co so you see how the shakedown works, right? It's ridiculous. And especially, and this came to a head with Flame, this unknown rapper that sued uh, Katy Perry, uh, and they said, you know, um, Katy Perry and all the co-songwriters said, I've never heard this Flame song in my life. On YouTube, it had like three million views or so, but this is an unknown person. Uh, the, judge, the jury said, well, it was enough that there were three million views on YouTube to constructively say that she subconsciously infringed, because she must have infringed because they has three million views, 
right? Ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. So if you are a songwriter getting shaken down, um, maybe you should be able to argue for lawyers and judges. And the whole purpose of this talk in the first place was to have judges and lawyers look at this and say, yeah, maybe we should move it from the end of the lifespan all the way to the beginning of the lifespan. Like at the beginning, motion dismiss says, first say, question one, is it copyrightable in the first place? The answer is no, case goes away. Maybe it's not copyrightable in the first place. Only if it's yes, it is copyrightable, then did you have actual access to the previous thing. Not constructive access, not subconscious infringement, but is there proof that Katy Perry heard flame? If the answer is no, that case should go away. Um, so the idea is that, uh, you know, with my talk, is that previously access and substantial similarity were the only questions being asked. But Noah and I kind of said, hey, maybe we should look at this copyrightability thing. Maybe melodies are not copyrightable in the first place, so you don't even have to get to access. You don't even have to get to substantial similarity. So anyway, so before the talk, um, almost all the cases lost. That is, all the defendants lost. So the Ninth Circuit, you may have heard of blurred lines. Uh, they lost uh, at the Ninth Circuit. Uh, judge denied the Katy Perry case as a matter of law. Said, no, you are, you are on the hook, Katy Perry, for this thing as a matter of law. Then that jury verdict happened to happen uh, on a Tuesday, and my TED talk was on Saturday, uh, right down the, down the street here. Um, so I held that up and said, this is ridiculous, right? Um, every defendant is losing, and it's, it's bullshit. Um, so I didn't say that in my TED talk, so if you watch my talk, I didn't say it's bullshit. Um, but they've almost always lost because they focused on those second two. Um, but then my talk happened in July, uh, August, I guess, of 2019, and I said, maybe copyrightable. I went live uh, on uh, YouTube in uh, January of 2020, um, and then afterward, uh, it blew up. I got some virality where uh, within a day, you can see this January 3rd, it's had 200,000 views uh, in one day. Um, and uh, currently has, uh, Ted reproduced it. Uh, now it has 1, 1 million views, so about 1.3 million or so uh, views amongst it. Um, I was originally gonna write this as a law review article uh, that usually gets maybe 1,000 views, right? Uh, so uh, so I, I think I'm doing much better than that. Noah and I are doing much better. Uh, Adam Neely, if you guys know Adam Neely, he interviewed me uh, about a week after. Um, at, uh, at the point of the talk, it had, uh, February 10th, so within a week or two of my talk, uh, 780,000 currently has 1.4 million views, uh, this Adam Neely video. Um, and the idea is that we want to make this uh, known to everybody because everyone now has access to all 400 billion of our melodies, right? Because conceptually, all of you in the room know exactly all the, every single one of those 400 billion, even if you don't hear, <laughs> right, all the 400 billion. You know conceptually that it's 12 up, 10 across, et cetera. Um, so uh, we are also made the, the top uh, post in Reddit. Uh, we also uh, were interviewed by The Atlantic. Um, uh, when I, I was actually in church when Noah said, look, we're the top host in Reddit. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and I said, yes, it's amazing. I should be in church right now. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, we also, like, Vice Motherboard interviewed us, uh, Independent out of the UK, The Telegraph out of the UK. Um, just a month and a half ago, I was on CBS Sunday Morning, which made my mom really proud. Uh, I, 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 I don't watch CBS Sunday Morning. Apparently 5.7 million per episode do watch, uh, watch that. Um, I got invented, uh, invited to a, uh, a music industry insiders group of New York, uh, LA, and Nashville lawyers and uh, technologists and business people in the music industry that are trying to figure out how, uh, how to make money. And we've been talking a lot. Uh, this is a, after a week, we had 85 different uh, threads talking about uh, whether my project is, is actually going to succeed, not succeed. And we have a whole frequent asked questions that was originally going to be my law review article that is now just on the web and now everybody can see. So anyway, so we've successfully, I think, moved the conversation from is there access and substantial similarity to is it, uh, is it copyrightable in the first place? So after all those things, the Ninth Circuit found that the Led Zeppelin case, they said that Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven, uh, the people suing Stairway to Heaven, uh, that was not copyrightable. Uh, that was after my talk. Also after my talk, the judge in the Katy Perry case went reversed what she had said earlier. So it was said earlier, as a matter of law, you cannot win. After the jury verdict, she reversed the jury as a matter of law. Uh, this is within a month and a half after my, uh, after my talk, uh, saying that it is not copyrightable because it is too trite, it is too common, it is too easy to overlap these other ones. Um, then the Ninth Circuit affirmed that district court judge, saying a pitch sequence, which is what we're counting, uh, is not entitled to copyright protection because those are building blocks of music uh, that are in the public domain that should not be copyrighted. Um, she could have cribbed that from my talk, the author of this. So there's a correlation versus causation aspect of it. Uh, you know, everybody before my talk lost, everybody after my talk <laughs> is winning. Um, I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to whether it works, but we feel really good about this. I was just invited to Duke Law uh, about a month and a half ago, and the copyright uh, professor there, Jennifer Jenkins, who's amazing, uh, she, uh, she said that, you know, I think, Damien, you can take a victory lap, that actually what we're doing is making a big difference here. Um, but, Katy Perry, thank you. 
Not yet. And, and, and sadly, also, uh, the morning of my Duke Law talk, uh, Ed Sheeran also made that same argument, saying there are only so many notes in pop music, and there's, in, you know, overlapping is inevitable. So it could, uh, also, Ed Sheeran has not thanked me, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but really, the, the point is not to get thanked. The point is to be able to change the law, and I think that through our publicity that we've gotten, we've actually changed the law in a, in a very good way. Um, so anyway, so now really the, the almost every lawsuit that's going forward, including the Dua Lipa lawsuit, I anticipate that she's going to say, hey, is this thing copyrightable in the first place? And if the judges or the lawyers or the clerks to the judges have watched our talks or have been able to see all the publicity, maybe they're going to think, yeah, maybe they're not copyrightable in the first place. Maybe this case goes away as a motion to desist. So really, the question now is that independent creation, um, did we revive it? Did we actually say, hey, you can independently create again? Because the real question is, is it copyrightable in the first place? And the answer to that is probably not. Uh, we have two minutes left, so now we can start thinking about, OK, machine composers. Um, Noah and I did not compose the 400 billion. What we did is we set the parameters, and then we hit start, right? And then we pushed things through. Um, since 1965, the US Copyright Office has said, hey, is that copyrightable or not? Is a machine-created thing copyrightable? Because they said, hey, we're going to, in 1965, they said, we're going to have machines creating copyrightable things. Um, and they're going to say that, you know, a computer, if it's like a typewriter, um, maybe it is copyrightable. Um, and so then, you know, is all the music a typewriter, right? Because we set the parameters and we said, okay, just start typing the thing. Um, so really the question in my one minute left is, is machine-created works copyrightable or not? If the answer is yes, machine-created works are copyrightable, then Noah's and my work is copyrightable, and then we copyrighted it all, and then put it all in the public domain. Therefore, everybody can use all 400 billion melodies. That's if yes, right? If the answer is no, it is not copyrightable, the, answer, the question is why not? Why is it not copyrightable? If the answer is because those are facts or ideas, they're not original or creative, that kind of proves our point, right? Because if, if a machine can't get copyrighted because it's factual, if a human makes the same melody as the machine, Maybe is that not copyrightable too? So either way, we win, right? Uh, if the humans make identical melodies, uh, maybe those cases go away. Um, most of the um actually is they say, Damien, I don't think because people don't actually have access to your 400 billion melodies. So, uh, so then, you know, yeah, you put it on an interactive archive, but they didn't actually hear the melody 350 billion. Uh, therefore, they don't, uh, you can't do it. They're talking about this, uh, this uh, it, it, is it copyrightable in the first place? They're not talking about the uncopyrightable in the first place. Um, and so anyway, so that, uh, that's the more interesting question. And that's the one where, you know, if we say life of the author, I said 100 years, but it's actually life of the author plus 70 years. Um, should we give somebody a monopoly of that uh, where uh, uh, maybe we, we shit it out at 300,000 melodies per second? Uh, we should not give somebody the copyright. I'm at the end of my time. Maybe one question uh, before we run out of time, and I'll stay afterwards. Any questions? Uh, that's, 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 I think, a really good last question. Uh, so the, um, uh, because the, a lot of people say, you know, uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star is the same as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which is the same as blah, blah, black sheep, have you any wool? Um, when I say that to people, they're like, holy shit, I had no idea that, that was, those were all the same melody. <laughs> and the reason you don't know that they're the same melody uh, is because they're different songs, right? And they have different rhythms, uh, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G versus blah, blah, black sheep, have you any wool? Right? Those are different rhythms. Um, you could sing that at a different tempo, right? still be the same song. You could be able to sing, uh, you know, if you add a couple more words in there, you can add other rhythms. So of, of those ideas, uh, the variance in uh, tempo, in rhythm, in little variations in tempo, the legal standard is substantial similarity. So it, it's always going to be substantially similar. So that's the problem we're solving. Uh, so even if we just have quarter notes, it's still going to be enough. Uh, with that, uh, I'm now a minute over my time. Thank you, everyone. Okay.